Oh, hi there. This is M.P. Fitzgerald, author of A Happy Bureaucracy, and I'm pretending to play the jazz piano. You know, advertisements were invented by the devil to make Ayn Rand happy, (laughs) and no one wants to make Ayn Rand happy. But audio production is expensive. So to keep commercials off this podcast, I've got all three ebooks in the Happy Bureaucracy series rolled into one for the price of a single book, which honestly is the best way to support this podcast. Just check the description for a link and tell your friends about the crazy shit you have been listening to to have less friends. Thanks. And now, for something completely different. A Happy Bureaucracy by M.P. Fitzgerald Narrated by Gary Bennett Author's Note Strewn between drug use, groin malice, and cursing on a level tantamount to sacrilege are gratuitous mentions of bureaucracy. These bureaucratic references may not be for the weak of heart. Chapter 16 Well-earned relief did not find the two for some time. There was simply no room for it. The felled tree was enough to stymie the colonel, and the forest fire would keep him at bay. Away from their pursuers, and with the book they could use to bring freedom to many, they now had to escape an enemy far worse because it was destructive with indifference. The fire... This was not an immediate concern, as at first it seemed as though the shark would rally far ahead of it, leaving it as distant smoke on the horizon. But this forest, filled with the bones of trees, was drier than the surface of mercury. It might as well have been an ocean of kindling because the effect was the same. The fire spread from one tree to the next in a flash, moving in every direction. Only ten minutes had gone since they set it, and the air was already thick with oppressive smoke. Then minutes more, and ashes would fall like snow. Once they were at the top of the mountain, near where they had set up camp for the past two days, the fire had caught up to them. It had no need to follow the road like they had, and it spread furiously. The skeletal spires that covered the mountain blazed in a hellish inferno. It had become a place Satan himself could easily call home, or at least a place that would make a killer image for a heavy metal album. Had there been any life in the old grove of dead trees, animals would flee in desperate droves, but man had taken care of them a generation ago. With his adrenaline spent and his nerves raw and tired, Arthur took the inferno that raged around him with a surreal sort of stride. This is no tragedy, he thought as Robbie navigated the mountain's windy road. A forest is something that is alive. Maybe this is just tidying up the mountain. If it was being tidied, it was being done feverishly. The road descended in a zigzag. They were prisoners to the whims of the road, but the fire was not. It looked like the fire was going to overtake them on their right. The smell of smoke burned their nostrils, and the light around them had taken on an almost urine-like quality. Urine from a person with dehydration. The shark gave them no shelter from it, and the toxic air easily made its way into the cabin. Rabia, of course, was still smoking cigarettes. This was stressful, after all. If God had wanted them to die, then he blinked and lost his place. The fire went in the direction it wanted to, and was more content to take out the rest of the forest laterally instead of moving downward. For now, anyway. The road's corners were tight. Arthur felt nauseous and Rabia looked exhausted. After an hour's drive, they had made it back to the base of the mountain, leaving hell behind them. After driving a mile from the mountain's base, Rabia slowed to a stop. Her knuckles eased from the steering wheel. She sighed deeply, releasing some tension and stress. He reached for his seatbelt buckle, forgetting that Rabia had lobbed it off, then got out of the car, half fearing the onset of another crisis. Instead, he found Rabia by his side with two beers and a weary smile. They cheered their libations and drank up, gazing at the burning mountain behind them. Staring at massive fires we have caused can totally be our thing, Rabia said. It is super romantic. Arthur watched the nightmarish scene unfold, not feeling it to be the least bit romantic. 
but before he could say anything, Robbie pulled softly on his tie and drew him in for a kiss. Her lips were chapped, the air around them was thick with smoke, and the taste of cigarettes on her tongue wasn't particularly appealing. But he embraced her tightly, and his heart sang. She was right. This was somehow romantic, in a demented, twisted, and gonzo crazy way. But just the same, they leaned on the hood of the car and swigged their beers. For the first time, the silence that fell between them was not awkward. It was an understanding. Someday, when the fire had eaten all of the wood, they would be back here. And when that happened, they would have an army with them. I feel like we just stole the plans to the Death Star, Arthur said with a chuckle. What in the hell is that? Robbia asked, a single eyebrow poking above her shades. It's from a movie they show in the bunker every Christmas, Arthur replied, now nostalgic for his concrete cubicle and homesick for paperwork. It's about a farmer and space wizards. Indeed. It makes more sense when you see it. With a long, final pull, Robbia emptied her bottle and threw it on the pavement ahead of them, shattering it into dozens of pieces. Arthur was getting used to her sudden bursts of aggression, so he decided to launch his bottle too. Robbia looked up at Arthur, passed a second beer to him, and lit another cigarette. What happens now, G-Man? We got your book... Was it worth losing some top brass and government property? I don't know, Arthur replied honestly. With DeWitt dead, that means Boyd has him out of the way, like he wanted. The IRS will follow its letter, though. Those people will be liberated when we collect back taxes. Maybe making the world a little bit less cruel was worth it. He looked up at the ground, burdened by recent memories, then glanced up at Rabia. Hmm, maybe not. To hell with that. Robbia said with conviction. Your goody two-shoe bullshit is starting to rub off on me, G-Man. But before I met you, I didn't think the world could be less cruel. We did good today, and we taught those Nazi bastards something they will never forget. Don't fuck with us. Arthur contemplated this and relented that they had at the very least achieved the latter. The mountain behind them was a testament to it. He started to run the consequences of their journey in his mind and came to a likely path it would lead to. Boyd would be in charge, and it was clear that he was hungry for power, so surely he would take the book as a trophy for a census campaign. Arthur would come home to no promotion and would have to answer to Ralph. Safety had not found him. The thing that he had coveted the most, and the thing he was promised, was no longer possible. But was that so bad? He would be auditing by Robbie's side, and he couldn't think of a person he would rather spend hell with. After what they had just done, was there some more audit work in the United Wastes? Further, an institution of slavery was in the crosshairs of the same organization that brought down the mob in the 1930s. Arthur had lost sight of his office dreams, but he had gained a friend and disillusionment from his hero. That last part was bitter, and though he might have been happier staying in ignorance, he would not have grown. Arthur wrapped his arm around Robbia's back and drew the side of her hips to his. She moved her hand up his back, and they drank their beers in a companionable silence. The thing that no one tells you about forest fires is that they produce the best sunsets. As the sun slowly dipped toward the horizon, red streaked like blood on a purple carpet in the sky, the yellow-orange haze of the inferno lit up the mountain. If Arthur's adrenal gland could keep up with the abuse, he very much would have loved to spend his life with Rabia. Don't break my heart, G-Man, Rabia said, or I'll shove an ice pick behind your eyes and scramble your frontal lobe. You're horrifying, Arthur retorted. Also, after what I've seen you do, he pointed at the mountain with his beer. If I break your heart... I'm going to eat a bullet before you can get to me. Good deal, said Rabia. She took a long pull off of her beer, tossed the bottle to the twisted highway, and listened to it shatter. We need to make some headway before we run out of light. Arthur finished his beer as Rabia made her way back to the shark's cabin. He was going to throw his bottle too, and, for a brief moment, actually craved the chaos from it, but elected to gently place it on the ground instead. He then fought a terrible urge to mark the beers off the manifest. 
Once back in the shark, Rabia steered it back towards their destination. Home. The road ahead of them, cracked and ill-gotten, twisted into the horizon like an endless golem turned snake. The shark, despite whining initially, quickly became hungry for more concrete to tear into. With the immediate danger behind them, Arthur, drunk with love from his kiss with Rabia, allowed his intense curiosity to feed, picking up the giant tome that they had stolen. Though he had opened it before to examine the bullet hole, he had not drunk in the misery and sorrow that the pages contained. Each page was meticulously written on in a very small and tightly packed margin. There was no date, but there were days listed from one at the beginning going into the thousands. The sheer amount of people listed on a single page was overwhelming. The volume of human misery was staggering, and it was listed with the same cold-hearted apathy of a tax return. It was as if Arthur was staring into a mirror darkly, the methods of bureaucracy used to its zenith to buy and sell human souls. The man in Arthur wanted to scream, while the number cruncher in him wanted to admire the handiwork. The apathy scrolled across the pages for the crimes committed was more numbing than the number of people listed. There were names, with his own listed as the last, but most of the slaves were referred to as man, woman, or child. As he looked at the half-empty page that held his name, he realized that he was only a quarter of the way through. The sociopathic ambition. That was the worst part. The fact that there were many, many more pages for the colonel to fill with anally retentive business keeping. If God was still alive, this would be the final nihilistic arrow that killed him for good. Overwhelmed with empathy and sorrow, Arthur remembered what Robbie had said the day before. You bought a slave once? He asked her. To set her free, Rabia said, defensively, keeping her eyes on the road. You helped them profit. To set her free, Arthur, she repeated, hurt washing over her face. He wasn't angry at her. He was just angry. He sat quietly for a minute, not daring to say anything more, afraid that he would say something undeserved. He returned his attention to the morbid book. He had ignored an important margin and was presently giving it the attention it deserved. Client. There were names here, but one came up again and again. On every page, main client appeared without fail. Whoever was buying these people by the bulk, they were responsible for the scale of the colonel's operation. Somewhere out there, there was somebody far worse than the slavers. Robbie parked the car off the road. Dusk was upon them. They were coming up to the dust plains with nothing on the horizon to hide them. She cleared her throat to get Arthur's attention. He jolted to the sound, coming back into the reality around him. He had become too immersed in the book to notice that they had come to a stop. We camp here tonight, Robbie said. We'll rotate sleep. There's nothing to hide us out here, and I don't want to risk driving at night. With that, she got out of the car, refusing to look at Arthur. Her name was Melody, she said, hurt in her voice. You don't have to explain yourself. I do. Please. I've told no one this since I left the caravan. She was beautiful. Beautiful and sad. The shepherd forbade us to trade anything with slavers. But half of the cold-hearted bastard sister wives were bought. So, what the hell? I traded a rifle for her. Rabia removed her sunglasses revealing the hot tears they hid, swelling in her eyes. So I brought her home. I don't think she actually liked me, though I hoped she would. I think she just stayed around those first couple of days to repay her freedom. The night she left, someone had caught us as naked as the day God spat us out. They went straight to the shepherd. Arthur had never seen Robbie so vulnerable. He had hurt her with his accusation. It was just a question the anger in it directed at his gruesome reading material. But the underlying message was, how dare you? He felt like an asshole. You are a good woman, Charlie Brown, he said, and Robbie smirked. The shepherd had never been able to read the Bible that he touted at us, she continued. But he claimed that what I had done was a terrible sin. 
There was no room in that maggot-infested mind of his for a black bisexual woman. Hell, there was no room in his mind for any type of queerness. By the time I had got my clothes on, Melody had fled, taking her freedom and my heart with her. By the time I had returned to my mother's rig, a dozen of the caravan's men were there with the caravan's sheriff. The rules of the caravan were clear. My mother could give me up to them and their hungers, or she could give up her rig. A vehicle is everything in a caravan. It is a status symbol, a means of survival, and a home. Many had coveted her truck for as long as she had it. My mother gave it up to protect me, but I had earned her scorn. She never looked at me after that with anything but shame. She had agreed that I had sinned. I found a new hell in the loss of my mother's affection. There was distance between them, both physical and emotional. Arthur fought his instilled awkwardness and closed the gap. He embraced Rabia, holding her small frame and felt convulsions of silent crying shaking through it. She took a deep breath. One reason you don't trade with slavers, she went on, besides the fact that no one should own another, is that you could go from customer to product quickly. They raided us in the night, having followed me back to my caravan. They were patient. They waited for days. When the hammer came down, my mother went up against a wall. She fought. The rifle I traded, my rifle, it was the one that did her in. Half of the caravan was taken or killed that night. All of it my fault, all because I was selfish enough to fall in love. I'm so sorry, said Arthur softly. Rabia took a moment to gather her strength. She built up her composure, and the serious wry Robbia reappeared again. We were too small in numbers to end them like I wanted, but I did the next best thing. I did what any patriot would do. I killed the sheriff to take his rank, got the ugly swine bastards who took my mother's rig passed out drunk, and then castrated them in the night. You're horrifying, Arthur said, with less jest than before. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Don't apologize. This was cathartic. I've never had the chance to ravage slavers since then. So your plan to take this book, well, I could never repay you for the hell I got to bring down on them. I trust you, and that is something I felt was impossible in the United Wastes. He expected her to move away from him, to either set up camp or fish out what little drugs she had left. Instead, her lips found his and her hips pressed against his feverishly. He drew in her breath and felt her breasts heave on his chest. Her hands pulled his shirt out from his pants and moved their way underneath, finding the skin of his back. He reached for the fly of her shorts, and she pushed him away, gently. She ran to the shark and unpacked some blankets, which she threw to the floor, then returned to his embrace. Arthur moved his mouth over her neck, and she wrapped her legs firmly around him. They raced to remove each other's clothes, exposing themselves to the cold temperature which had dropped significantly with the sun's light. But they found warmth in their union. About the Author M.P. Fitzgerald is an author and humorist dedicated to injecting the feverish gonzo style into fiction. You can get Memos from the Wasteland, which is the official prequel to this book, free. It contains hilariously bleak office drama, Robbie's diary, and Arthur's last letter from his father. To get your copy, just head over to his website at mpfitzgerald.art. You'll also get free updates on future audiobooks and more. We hope you have enjoyed A Happy Bureaucracy by M. P. Fitzgerald, narrated by Gary Bennett. Text copyright 2019 by M. P. Fitzgerald. Production copyright 2021 by M. P. Fitzgerald. Music by Dust Mice, available on all streaming services and dustmice.bandcamp.com.